From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. President Biden says he'll release more oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve as OPEC cuts oil production, plus what today's job report says about the economy. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We are joined today by my colleagues, columnist Kim Strassel and editorial board member Mane Ukwe Barua. Welcome and happy Friday to you both. So we had a lull in gas prices, but it seems like it's ticking back up again, Kim. And this comes with news that OPEC is taking about 2 million barrels of oil off the markets, trying to push prices up even further. Uh, let's start with a clip of White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre responding to that news. OPEC's decision uh, to cut production's quotas is short-sighted while the global economy is dealing with the continued negative impact of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. If there's a meaningful price impact of OPEC's decision, it will particularly be on low and middle uh, income countries. The president's efforts have made progress bringing down uh, U.S. gas prices since the beginning of the summer. Gas prices are down nearly a dollar and 20 cents. And the most common price at gas stations today is three dollars and 29 cents per gallon. Kim, there was also a White House advisor who responded to the OPEC decision saying it's a reminder of why it is so critical that the United States reduce its reliance on fossil fuels. And I guess I sort of understand that thinking, but if you look at the federal data, 79% of America's energy last year was fossil fuels, natural gas, oil, and coal. And so I don't get this short-term argument. It seems to me that it's going to be a long time before we don't have to worry about what OPEC does. Yeah. Well, first of all, on the OPEC question, you know, I appreciate that Karine Jean-Pierre is worried about lower and middle class Americans, but the Saudis and OPEC, that is not necessarily their top concern. They see the potential here as economies are slowing down for there to be less demand. And they're very worried, therefore, that this is going to hit their bottom line. So if you reduce production, you increase prices, and that is going to help them pay the bills. Now, if we'd have maintained potentially a better relationship with Saudis in particular since the beginning of the Biden term, maybe that they would be more receptive to arguments. But despite the president's going there recently on a trip on kind of bent knee, that alone is not necessarily going to repair some of the damage that has been done to that relationship. So there thinking on their own terms at the moment. And yes, this whole argument, well, this means that we need to be less reliant on fossil fuels. That's a great thing to say, except for it's not happening anytime soon. As you just mentioned, about 80% of our generation came from fossil fuels. By the way, that hasn't changed much in decades. I think about 15 years ago, it was like 81%. So despite the massive investment that we have put into solar and wind, and it's because demand has also increased as well, too. And so you can have all these grand plans. They're not going to pan out. What we can do a little bit more immediately is rev up further the drilling operations that we have here in the United States that are already here, set, ready to go, projects that are available to come online were it not for the fact the Biden administration is in standing in the way of that and in the way of more jobs that would produce that oil. Yeah, it does seem to me that this administration seems to recognize that we need oil prices to be at a reasonable place, that we need oil in the economy, in people's gas tanks. And yet it doesn't want that oil drilled in the United States. It wants it drilled anywhere else. And on the point about Saudi Arabia, there are three Democrats now who are calling on the U.S. to take troops out of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Here's the quote. It is time for the United States to resume acting like the superpower in our relationship with our client states in the Gulf, unquote. Manet, I mean, do you think that's a persuasive argument? I mean, I thought that part of the reason that we had troops in Saudi Arabia is, for instance, to counter the aggression of Iran. Sure. The only small concession I could make to those three congressional Democrats is that, yes, when you do place troops in a region, when you do sort of create a strategic alliance with another country, you are hoping that they're going to be more amenable to cooperating with you on other initiatives. And definitely in the past, we have had the expectation that our military support for Saudi Arabia, the arms that we sell to them, is going to help keep the door open to negotiations on energy. That said, I think the idea that 
a short-term decision by OPEC to cut production because they very reasonably expect the economy to contract is going to lead us to completely reconsider our strategic alliance with them and exert leverage over them and potentially alter our partnerships in country Iran is pretty ridiculous. And it shows either that these democratic representatives don't understand the stakes and sort of everything that goes into striking strategic partnerships like the one we have with Saudi Arabia, or that they're just trying to score some short-term political points. And I think that's probably the more likely explanation. They know that the midterms are coming. They know that people see gas prices and are going to vote based on how much pain they're feeling at the pump every week. And so they want to go to the podium, shake their fists and show that they're talking tough with the people who they blame for increasing the gas prices and basically shift responsibility from President Biden's role in the energy crisis. Meantime, the Journal is reporting that the Biden administration is preparing to scale down sanctions on Venezuela in part so that we can get some more of the Venezuelan oil pumping into the global markets. The National Security Advisor spokeswoman said, quote, there are no plans to change our sanctions policy without constructive steps from the Maduro regime, unquote. Kim, what do you make of this? Again, it goes completely along with what we've been saying. Apparently, the mission is anywhere but the United States. And that means that we're willing to go to a country that has a dictator in charge who has impoverished his nation, is socialist in his approach, has caused a refugee crisis in the area, and that we're going to tantalize him with the notion that we might ease sanctions on the promise of some sort of good faith negotiation with his opposition, which may or may not happen. I can't see how this is preferable in any way, once again, to American jobs and American production, not just in the short term, but in the long term. This is the problem countries get themselves into. Why is Germany in such dire straits right now, given the Ukrainian conflict and the fact that Russia is not sending it as much oil and or it's not buying as much oil from Russia. It's because it spent 20 years doubling down on renewables. And then you end up in a crisis situation and people realize there's no quick fix. Like one of the things we need to be doing now is drilling more, producing our own resources, not just so that we can deal with the situation currently, but to make sure that 10 years from now, when there's another unseen conflict, we're not in this position again. And the answer to that is not by begging Venezuela for a short term oil hit. Well, I do wonder what the administration is thinking here, because lifting sanctions on Venezuela, because the president is worried about the political effect of rising gas prices, I think would itself be a political problem. And we're now only about a month off from the November elections. Manet, the other thing that strikes me, and Kim has made this point, we've made this point on the podcast before, is that the U.S. is the largest producer of oil in the world. But if you look at the numbers from the Energy Information Administration, U.S. production is still under the pre-pandemic peak. And depending on which part of that peak you pick, it's something like seven, eight, nine percent below that figure. And so it seems to me that the obvious thing for President Biden to do here is to make amends with the oil industry and, you know, say that he sees the need for their product to continue existing in the world for a time, even if he keeps talking about a future energy transition and ask how he can help, what regulations he can lift. How can we get some Democrats along to get the Mountain Valley Pipeline in West Virginia done, get projects like that built? And he just seems unable or unwilling to do that. Right. I think you have to separate this question into short term and long term. In the short term, you're exactly right. U.S. producers have not returned to pre-pandemic production. And that has a lot to do with the fact that it's very difficult to restore capacity once you've shut it off. And so obviously, during the beginning of the pandemic, it became very hard to produce. And also people expected demand worldwide to be depressed for much longer than it was. So they took a lot of capacity offline and then basically restored struggling to get it back to 100% and still have it managed to. There isn't that much that the president would be able to do to sort of increase that short-term capacity. There are certain things like pipeline projects and things like that that sort of expand the capacity, but that takes time. But certainly it wasn't helpful that President Biden was actively blaming these producers and basically accusing them of intentionally limiting the supply for the sake of improving their profits when if you look at the logistics to go into restoring capacity, it's very difficult for them to do. 
do. And so that fostered a lot of distrust between the oil industry and the president. But in the long term, I think you're absolutely right. The Biden administration has made it more difficult for these energy companies to lease public lands, made it more difficult for them to actually get drilling permits on the land that they have. And all of this makes them much more cautious about investing in new capacity and really tapping into the United States' full energy potential. And so I think that the voting public is certainly going to see that the Democratic Party has basically put the United States in this position where we are dependent on foreign producers of oil. And President Biden's probably going to take some political hit from that. And Kim, on the question of short term and long term, one of the arguments that you constantly hear, I feel like, from people responding to the case I just made that President Biden should make amends with the fossil fuel industry is that any investment that happens now has a lead time. And so it won't alleviate the short-term oil crunch that we're in right now. What do you make of that claim? Well, there are some things that can be done. And it's true, as Manet was saying, they're along the edges. And we have certainly seen our oil industry here in the United States kind of pledge to ramp up to the degree that they can. You can certainly allow for more drilling. And the states have been doing that in some of these areas where we've been doing a lot of shale fracking, for instance. But I think the bigger point about the long term is exactly that, kind of what I was alluding to before, is that why are we in the situation we're here now, in part because this pullback was begun more than 18 months ago as the Biden team came in. They have been sending the message to banks, to drillers that don't bother investing in anything going forward because we're going to shut you down, essentially, and make the complete switch to renewables. That message has been heard. He's also been beating up a lot of these producers and suggesting that they're engaged in price gouging, etc. This is not a good way to earn cooperation or get some capital into projects that'll come online. So if that hadn't started several years ago, where might we be now? And we can't continue to allow that mentality to dominate because, again, when we get another few years down the road, we want to be in the situation where if there is some sort of world supply shock, we have some sort of ability to use American energy resources to withstand those currents. 